All right, I think I've got everything up and running. So hopefully you can see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up or a nod? We're screen sharing. Okay, perfect. Okay, we're at 12.01. Um, I know folks are still um, getting logged in, but we're gonna go ahead and um, get started so that we um, can get to Steve's presentation. All right, so welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, we are here for making online anatomy and physiology human. And um, we'll be introducing our um, presenter here in just a minute. Also today we have an award presentation. So um, that's gonna be fun. Um, we're gonna start off with just quick tools for today. I'm gonna uh, show you where to find our recording. Uh, we'll do our speaker introduction. And then uh, Jeremy Wynn, who is our uh, past chair from the e-learning council for the past year. Uh, Jeremy's going to present Stephen with the Connie Broughton Innovation in e-learning award. And then we'll uh, hand it over to Steve um, and Steve will do his presentation and we'll do Q and A. So that's what's up for today. Um, some tools that we're going to use, um, please put questions in the chat as we go, please raise your hand as we go. Um, Steve would like to take questions uh, within the presentation. We'll also have some time at the end to answer anything or follow up on stuff that we didn't get to while Steve's talking. Uh, feel free to use your reactions buttons to let us know uh, what you're thinking. Uh, cameras and mics, uh, feel free to turn those on during uh, discussion times, um, but please Please um, do keep your mic muted when you're not speaking. That does help us uh, cut down on background noise. And feel free to turn on the captions to view the live auto transcription. So um, we always get this question, where do we find the recording? Uh, we have a new uh, domain. We are HTTPS colon uh, slash slash wa dash cc dot org and then another slash so that's wac.org and there is a tab on our homepage for wacky wednesday webinars and since this screenshot was taken i have added the uh the menu item for the 2023 webinars and we will get the webinar recordings posted as soon as we have the recordings back from being uh having the captions corrected and i'll put this link into the chat for you uh, here in just one sec. All right, it is time for me to uh, introduce our speaker, and it is my great pleasure to um, introduce you to Dr. Stephen Shoemake. I've enjoyed getting to know Steve over the last couple of weeks as we've been collaborating on um, prepping for the webinar, so that's been fun. Um, Dr. Stephen Shoemake earned his Doctorate of Arts in Biology from Idaho State University in 1998. With over 23 years of experience, he is now tenured science faculty at Walla Walla Community College, where he teaches biology and anatomy and physiology to aspiring nurses, scientists, and learners of all kinds. Prior to joining Walla Walla Community College, he taught at Idaho State University and Owensburg Community College in Kentucky. Steve is passionate about teaching and also about the Seahawks. And despite not being a farmer, Steve resides with his family on 18 acres that his neighbors lease to raise heifers and grow crops. His wife, a microbiologist, his daughter, an artist, their two dogs and one cat enjoy the quiet and space of the countryside. So uh, please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Stephen Shoemake to um, our Wacky Wednesday webinar series. And I am going to hand it over to Jeremy Wynn, our ELC chair. And Jeremy is now going to present Steve's award. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm Jeremy Wynn. I'm the outgoing chair for the uh, eLearning Council. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here to present this award. I want to say just a few brief things about the eLearning Council. So we are a group of professionals. Uh, that work in e-learning throughout the Washington system of uh, community and technical colleges. Um, we have representatives from, I think, almost every, maybe maybe sans one or two colleges on our council. Um, and we report to the Instruction Commission, which is a similar group of, um, of leaders in the state of Washington um, that consists of the vice presidents of instruction for each of, of our colleges. Uh, so there's 34 
colleges in our system. Um, so this is a, a great opportunity for us to all get together and work on initiatives that we think are important. Um, in e-learning, one of the most important things that we can do is support professional development um, in an ever-changing world where technology is increasingly impacting what education looks like and, and what best practice looks like um, in the field of instruction. So for us, one of our, our work groups is the professional development work group, and, and that consists of a number of folks who, who work on this priority of how can we provide better professional development for faculty um, in our system. One of the initiatives of the professional development work group is to um, identify a candidate, multiple candidates, and select a winner for the Connie Broughton Innovation and E-Learning Award. So throughout the year, we solicit um, recommendations from folks and we ask for, um, you know, who's doing great things in e-learning, who's doing great things in teaching with technology and particularly in distance education. And so uh, Steve here was one of many candidates that we considered. Um, and there's a pretty thorough selection process where we review all of the applications and a board of folks votes on the winner. Um, and so without further ado, um, I want to congratulate Stephen, um, who, who um, I, I learned just recently um, taught in my uh, hometown of Owensboro, Kentucky, um, you know, uh, the stronghold of winners. And um, <laughs> and Stephen, congratulations on on your work in um, in online pedagogy, and we're just really thrilled to have you here to um, to help us all better understand how we can you know teach in this brave new world. So, um, Steve, congratulations, and I will yield the floor to you. Go ahead and do your screen okay. share now, Steve. Okay. Okay, are you seeing it now? Um, we've got your screen, but not your presentation. Okay, good. There we go. There we go. And slideshow view. There. You got it now? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Well, let me let me say before I get going today that that I owe a lot of thanks for this award to the people that I work with at Walla Walla Community College, who through their support have enabled me to to do this kind of work that I that I do. I am beholden to them for a lot, um, and one of the things I'm beholden to them for is is that. I learned through them that people that do online things are uh, have the same motivations that I did. Um, let me tell you a little bit about about myself and what I intend to present for you here today. I am that guy, um, that teacher that you've got that everybody's got at their at their school who's been there for a long time. I've been fairly highly reviewed in what I in what I do in class. Um, before COVID, I had never done an online class at all. Um, and COVID for me was was sort of a, an epiphany. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that when, when we get the, the slides rolling. Um, I learned that the things that I knew about good teaching still apply but that there were things in technology that I didn't know about that can make what I do better. And so I've tried to focus my presentation here today, not on the anatomy and physiology aspect of it per se, although it does, uh, it certainly is anatomy and physiology, but on the things that I think that everybody can apply to their courses um, going forward. So let me, let me set the stage. Um, even before COVID, I was at that stage in my career where I was wondering if my shtick was still working. Um, lots of talk about, uh, you know, are students getting worse? The uh, water cooler conversations. Um, 
I seemed to see more and more students that were having problems. They were less willing to study enough. Anatomy and physiology, just there's just no substitute for putting in time. And seemed to see that happening um, with a larger group of students. Um, some students, sadly enough, although they did put in enough time, were didn't know what to do. Uh, and I'm talking about how to study something like this uh, that's different than studying some of the other subjects that they were, they were in. And they just didn't know where to go. Um, and an overall feeling among way too many students that they just weren't very willing to commit to their, to their education. And uh, that was my thought because they weren't doing the things that, that I thought were inherent uh, that, that students should be doing. Um, and I think most of us have seen this, especially uh, once COVID hit, but even so, um, more students that have a lot of anxiety about, especially about science classes and less confidence in their concerning their abilities to, to do science classes. And I recognize these even before COVID as significant problems, significant issues that I, that I needed to deal with. Um, well, then COVID came along um, and you all know what happened, right? Yeah, um, all of those things got worse. Um, I saw larger groups of students with those problems. Um, it was clearly, clearly a problem. Uh, I had never done, uh, my, the administration came in and, for us and, and about the last two weeks of the, of the quarter and said, by the way, you're online from here on out. And we were online for the next two, two and a half years. Um, to make that worse, I thought when we went to uh, online instruction that at least the advantage that I'll have is this with this modern group of students, they'll be versed with the technology. They'll, they'll, they'll at least be able to use the technology. That uh, what I found pretty rapidly was that you can't make that assumption. That is um, absolutely not true with some, with some students. And it's a more significantly sized group than, than you think. So the assumptions that I ran with in trying to deal with this, this problem, um, I didn't believe that I had somehow forgotten to teach in the last 27 years. I, I know what I'm doing in the classroom and I know lots of things that, that work. And I really wanted to try to do as much of the things that I know as work as possible going, going forward. Um, but I was at a point I could continue to complain about it and do, do the same things, or I can do something to better serve my students, which required that I needed to identify where the deficiencies were, um, to look at the tools at my disposal and to do something. So what I'm gonna show you here today is the product of, I'm gonna focus on my anatomy and physiology class, although, um, I've applied many of these things to uh, all of my classes. Um, and, and I want to show you the things that I, that I focused on that are not necessarily anatomy and physiology dependent, but that I think are really important for online and in-class instruction, instructional use of technology. So the, my focuses, um, I see student engagement as being absolutely essential, um, absolutely important, whether you're in class or out of class. And by that, I mean, the student needs to be connected to me as an instructor. They need to be engaged with the material. If they're not doing something other than looking at it on a PowerPoint and to make it their own, then there's a problem. And ideally engaged with each other. Uh, there's a real value to having community, uh, whether they're online or in person, that they are connected with each other too. Um, this, this notion of me as a compassionate demander was one I saw on a, on a website that Alyssa pointed me to recently 
uh, that had to do with a humanizing um, group of people, or they call themselves humanizers for STEM classes. Um, and I haven't looked at it very much. I, that's not where I got my ideas, but they, this phrase was there and I, I like it very much. It says to me um, that I need to do some convincing early on and continually while I'm teaching to my students that I'm going to demand a lot of them, that it's gonna be very difficult, but that I'm doing it because I am very vested in their success and I won't do anything to you or for you or with you um, that I don't think is gonna serve you well going forward. Um, I also wanted to provide some explicit guidance as to how to do really well in a course like this. Um, I've always polled students on the first day and asked them about, um, asked them as one of their first assignments to ask me anything they, they wanted to about how the course would work or what they needed to, to do. And one of the really common questions always is, how do you study for anatomy and physiology? Um, oftentimes that's coming from a person who, who did it before and failed. Uh, so I wanted to include some things that, that I know work um, and that enough things that they could find strategies that worked for them. Uh, then there was the, just the practical thing. Uh, it was clear going to online instruction that navigation, although you think would be not a problem with something like Canvas, but navigation can be a significant problem for students. If there is too much in their face, um, if it's not easy to find, uh, there's a significant group of people that will be lost, that will uh, head, on, head on out the door. A lot easier to lose them online than, than when they're in class. And always, the last thing there, there were some things that I found in, in Canvas that facilitate more rapid feedback. That's valuable in my in, in class. That's something that I think haunts all of us that there's this balance between really good feedback and really fast feedback um, that you have to strike. And Canvas can help you with that kind of thing. So I hope to show you a little bit about each of those things that I did as we, as we roll along. So now you'll recognize this if, you see, if you've seen Canvas set up. This is uh, the first module that's in my, uh, it's in all of my classes. Um, Onboarding is significant in my class. It's very important in my class. Um, one of my adages that, that I try to follow is that if I didn't like it as a student, if I didn't get value from it as a student, I don't wanna do that to, to my students. And the first day instructor that pulled out the syllabus and read every word of it was one of my least favorite things. Um, and so I like to set this up uh, at least a, a week before classes start and, they, and when they first have access to their Canvas shell. And you can see that, that it all has prep. It's the, the first module that, that they are exposed to. And it is in fact tied to prerequisites so that until they finish each of these things, they don't get to go on and look at the rest of, of, of the modules. And notice that there are things that they're gonna have to clear quickly to do well. Things like getting your CTC link account, using the, this is the proctoring software, still kind of looking for a better solution than that, but that's, that's what we have right now. Um, all, all the students at community college have access to the whole uh, suite of Microsoft Office products so that they, they can get, they need to get set up with that immediately. And this is part of what I'll show you here in a second. Um, it's really literally just a blank schedule, the, kinds of, the kind of thing that we all put on our office doors with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the hours of the day on it. That's part of the onboarding um, that, I, that I have set up for them. Um, let me show you what this was. was. I have put this link to this um, PowerPoint presentation at the end because I don't want to show you the whole thing and, and talk about the whole thing and take too much time. Um, but 
but let me show you the, the, the why I have it here. Um, it is, in my mind, really important that students form some kind of a connection with me. Um, they don't have to love me, but they have to know that the reason that I'm doing this is for them and that the things that I are in, in presenting to them and, and giving to them are going to do them well. I tell them I won't present anything to you that I don't think is going to serve you well at the next level. And so you know, part of it is this, is this about me thing. Um, they need to know I'm a human being and I'm a, uh, a normal person that, I don't know, I was going to say normal person that likes the Seahawks, but is that normal? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, to present those kinds of the, those kinds of things to them, that's important to know that. Um, it's important to tell them the purpose of this class and not just it's a hoop to jump through the, to, for the nursing program that you have to do, but that it is actually the beginning of their education in nursing and the beginning of becoming a very competent professional at what they do. Um, character, this characteristics of a good nurse and a good student is something that I particularly like with respect to the onboarding. So I want to show you a little bit of that, and then, we'll, and then I'll come back to the slide in, in a second. Um, there's some characteristics that started out in, in England, in the health services um, industry in England, uh, and was transferred to a group called the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. They adopted it for the characteristics of an excellent nurse. And what I tell them is that this is what, what this group put for, forward as the people that they want to hire. Um, and I relate the things that they, that they mentioned, like care, they call them the six C's, compassion, competence, communication, courage, and commitment related those things to what, what I'm doing in this class, where we're heading in this class. And what I'll generally say is that you've got those first two. If you're going into nursing, you've got those first two. Um, that's the main reason most people go into those things. But here's what we start to build here. It's not enough to, to care about people. It's not enough to wanna to help people. You need to be competent. Um, how much time does a nurse get to spend with a patient on average? Uh, it's, it's really pitifully low. It's like seven minutes, something ridiculous like that. Um, you, you need to be able to communicate some very complex concepts at a high level to, to physicians and at an understandable level to patients. And so part of our work will be doing that when I ask you to write things and explain things in different ways, part of our work will be doing that. Um, you need courage and commitment, and that begins right now with, with, with this class. You gain courage and commitment by gaining competence and the ability to communicate what it is that we're working with. Um, Part of this onboarding then is a plea for them to use the materials and the things that are available to them. And one of the things that, that's available to them is me. Um, and so some of this is stuff that you would expect everybody to have on syllabi. You have Zoom and, and in-person office hours, um, posting schedules of where they can find me at all times. I really encourage them to to get into contact with me. Here's something, a little trick I learned in Canvas that I, that I liked very much that I have to point out here. Um, students see Zoom as something that, uh, as a mechanism for a teacher to schedule something live and then they'll show up once the schedule is set. If you use this, what's called a redirect link um, in your Canvas site, Zoom can be something that turns into a, an immediate contact with the, with the instructor. Um, it is, uh, I can set up a link so that they can click on that and immediately have my face and me talking to them um, as soon as I can get, as soon as I can get to it. Sometimes people, uh, instructors will say, gosh, I don't know if I want students to have that kind of contact. Well, you can always not answer the phone. It's like the phone. But what I've found is that the students 
um, are much more likely to use this if it's right there in front of them uh, and linked. Um, you'd be surprised how often you can solve things if students can talk to you. And then there's this first aid demographic demographic and personal data collection that's an important part of their first assignment. Uh, it's a quiz, it comes through Canvas, and one of the things that, that they need to do is give me why they're here. I can get the demographics of the class, but I give them an opportunity to ask me a question about anything, and I say everything's fair game, I'll try to answer it if I can, um, and to tell me one thing about themselves that is interesting or that I need to know. Um, you would be surprised what students will tell you at the beginning. Um, it, it's a nice way to form a connection with them right off the bat. Um, part of this onboarding involves explicit instructions on how to study for anatomy and physiology. It's built in. Uh, I have a, an assignment that they do that's based on uh, some of you might remember becoming a master student uh, a million years ago. Um, a lot of strategies that people can use to study for our difficult topics. And I tell them that, that this is a journey that they need to start. They need to figure out how they um, study for things like this. Um, another thing to solidify that connection with me is that I try to communicate with them um, as often as possible. Uh, my class is mostly asynchronous. We do have some live review sessions uh, where we all can get together in the same place. But what I've found is that if they can see my face um, and it's frequent, they, they do form a connection with you, even though it's not really you. Uh, it's important for me. Um, then there is the excuse me, the idea that I needed to work some on navigation and some on, on resources. And I wanted to, I want to show you the, the shell in a second and we can play around, give you a chance to, to ask me about some of those things. But let me, let me say a few things about my emphases there. Um, frequently used uh, information is I have modified the structure of my Canvas site a little bit. The most common thing that I've seen with Canvas sites is to have the page they land on be modules. Um, strangely enough, that in and of itself causes some problems, uh, especially as the quarter gets late, later on down, there's a lot of scrolling that has to happen to get to the, the information that they wanna have. With a couple of modifications, one uh, for cell phones and one um, with very readily available links on the on the front page, um, I am able to have most of the things that they need to access right there. Notice I, uh, that the, the home page is, is is formatted for a cell phone. I tell one of the first things I always tell them is you shouldn't be you doing this class on a cell phone, really. I mean, it's not. Uh, if you want to see things well and work with things well, it needs to be bigger, but you all know they do, right? They still do. And so at least with the things where they're trying to rapidly find something, the home page is set up in, in that way. So that's where I can put the daily schedule. I can put alternate contact contacts, lots of resources. And I wanted to make sure that all those things are a few clicks away. Um, that was kind of a strange way to arrange that, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> there's also engagement with, with the material um, that's important. And I think um, you see this built all the way through. One of the things that I think everybody can use right now with giving some thought is that students, Canvas has the capability of giving students feedback rapidly. Now there is some give and take um, with respect to how much feedback you can give them, but within, with things like rubrics for complex assignments at the front end or grading rubrics, rubrics on the back end, I am capable of getting things back to them more quickly in time for them to adjust to it, in time for them to learn from the things they screwed up before something, um, something summative happens, before a, a quiz 
happens. Um, and so you, you will see those kinds of things built in to this too. This link that I've got right here is, is so that I can get to the, the page, the shell to show it to you. Um, it's not a live link for you all, but there is a link on the very last slide of this presentation so that you can access this stuff your, yourself when we, when we get there. So let me, let me show you a few things, show you some of this stuff in action. <clears throat> so here's the, the first page. And if it, if it looks a little bit odd to you, it's because of that cell phone adaptation that I made there. Um, you'll see some of the other pages will fill the, in, the entire screen, maybe look a little bit better uh, aesthetically. Um, but what I found is that when I do this and they call it up on a cell phone, the individual items that I've selected to put here are much easier to see and to access. If they need to get at something quickly um, and, and access something quickly, it's, it's all right here in front of them. And so things like the syllabus, for instance, my syllabus is, uh, is both an online one and a, the required sort of printed out syllabus. Um, and there are things linked to each of the, the, the important components uh, in the syllabus. Let me show you this as if it were just one of the other pages. This is important. Um, when they, it, it's too easy with all the stuff that's in Canvas to get off uh, on a tangent and get lost. There's always a place, a link down at the bottom to take you right back to this course homepage. And so let me show you some of the things that are, uh, that are here. Um, there is uh, one of the things that uh, about the onboarding that I that I tell them is if you don't know where you're going, if you don't have a plan, um, you often will end up somewhere else. Um, and so there is an overall plan for everything here for the for the entire quarter. The the things are are mapped out for for them. Um, there are modules, and so there's that first module that I showed you before that onboarding module. And there is a, um, there is still that, that scrolling issue. You know, I hate it, students to have to scroll down a long way to get to something. Uh, what I found is that you can avoid that. Um, a little tweak back here um, on modules. Once a week, I go in and change that link and you can actually set it on any one of the modules. And so I set it on the current module every week. It's their one click away from getting all the resources that they need um, for that week. Um, there's exam schedules with links to the online exams when there are on it, online exams and review sheets. There are alternate resources. Um, and I found some of these alternate resources are pretty heavily used. Um, <clears throat> I've got a coloring book. Um, I know that's really old, old fashioned, but you know, one of the things I tell, tell students is that that's something you can do when you're at the end of the day, when you're so tired and you can't get one more thing done, you can color, right? Um, there's a, a link to tutorials in animation. Um, they are PowerPoint presentations that run uh, automatically. If you show, show the students how to turn them on, um, they run automatically. Um, there are ways that students can be rehearsing um, important aspects of uh, lab stuff, especially lab materials, especially when they're outside of class. If I can get them doing that outside of class, then we can spend the in-class time, which I hope if, if the only in-class time we've got is, is lab, then we can work with that. And we really like to have people in lab working, working with these things. Lots and lots of different links there. Um, I know I'm rolling through a lot of this pretty 
uh, pretty quickly, um, but I wanted to leave uh, I wanted to leave a link uh, to to the the things in my class so that you were um, you could access them at the end of this presentation. I'll I'll show you in a second. At the end of this presentation is a link to all of these things. And so if you want to see something now, well, by all means, pipe up. Let's let, let's take a look at it. Um, but uh, there, there are also things that you can, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can access later. I've got this class on Com Canvas Commons, if you've got Cam Canvas to check out. Um, I've also got uh, it links for everybody, even if you don't have Canvas, where you can you can look around the the canvas site um surviving anatomy and physiology is that is that onboarding presentation uh, one of the one of the really important things at the end of that is is me telling them that they need they need a plan and that they need to go start working on some of these, these things steve yeah. Before we go on, um, we do have a question in the chat from Tara. Uh, okay, Tara. Tara. Tara wants to know: Do you use a textbook or OER? I use OER. Um, I have a, uh, and that's one of the things that's that is linked in there. Um, I have uh, an OpenStax textbook, Anatomy and Physiology textbook, that we use, and that's kind of a nice nice thing from for a number of reasons it's uh it is you've got they've got access to it online if they prefer they've got they can download a pdf to it it's it's completely modifiable by me uh and if they need a hard copy and there's still still quite a few people that really want a hard copy they can get one at a really nominal price it's like i think it's like 35 dollars you get it through Amazon or through our bookstore. Um, and it's really, uh, I, we won't, I don't think we'll ever go back now that we've, now that we've done that. And a follow up question from Tara. Um, Tara's asking, are you finding students are reading the book? Absolutely, they're reading the book, Tara. Uh, and, and part of that, uh, that reading is the way that I tell them to approach my class. Um, it is asynchronous, and so um, I tell them I want to, I want them to come at it in reverse for for the way that they've been told for a lot of classes. Meaning, come in and watch the lecture that's scheduled for the day first. Um, take notes on it. Believe it or not, you have to model that for them on uh, taking notes they they when you give them something that's asynchronous and that's and that's visual like that um you get a certain number of students that think just watching it over and over again is going to get it done for them um but they absolutely do the reading because i i say that is going to tell you what you need to read and go from that to finding those things in the textbook and, and reading those things to support them. Um, it's one of my adages that I throw at them over and over again, that the number of as many different ways as you can come at the same topic, being it reading, coloring, um, getting it in your hands, uh, going through tutorials, all of those different kinds, the more different ways you can come at something, the more likely it is to, um, to, to work for them. Another thing, Tara, that I do to, to, to make sure that they read and to make sure that they're in the right place is I have as part of my lectures um, what I call questions to investigate. Uh, and that just means things that they, they usually are fairly brief questions that ask them to explain something, uh, find something. And the rule is, I'm not going to talk about that, but it will be on the test. What it does is it gets them to the right place in the textbook uh, where they need to be reading if they're having trouble finding finding it. And I have found that, well, let me say this, the ones that do well do a lot of reading and they and they find that that's a, a, that's a logical way um, 
to come about it. Did I answer your question, Tara? I'll have to assume, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks, I was on mute, sorry. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I just, I've taught anatomy for years and, you know, you can kind of figure out the students that are that are good note takers, students that are are able to read and retain. Because one of the things I find in other classes that I teach, as well as A&P, is a student might read something, but they're not really understanding or retaining, um, which is kind of where our role really kicks in, really. Ex think about exactly, it. exactly. Right? And yeah. so that's why I, that's why I go yeah. in reverse. I've, I've found that yeah. when they when they pre-read, they come in with really almost nothing, really, because they they get so they they do that halfway down the page and they're lost and they back up and start again and halfway down the page yeah. and they back. And so and, and I tell them that's my role. That's why I'm yeah. here. If I could just give you a textbook and say, read it and, and memorize it and that worked, then you'd be I'll, out of a job. I'd be out of a job and it would be and it would yeah. and it doesn't. But right. when I when I prep them for that reading with the lecture that I'm doing, uh, it does work. I, I find that method to be really effective as well, um, is I kind of plant the seeds and then I need them to really figure out what they know and what they don't know so that I can do my job better. Um, that, that's right and then you know the, i'm glad you said that because that reminds me of another thing with with respect to assignments we need to do something other than um asking them to take notes and review them they need to go another another step beyond that and so one of the one of the study recommendations is that they when when people say but i need a i need one recommendation that i can use uh, the the one that I tell people that works for almost everyone is is rewriting their notes, and they say what? That sounds like a lot of busy work to me. Um, and I say, well, yeah, um, in a way. Um, but what what you're doing is taking the things that I think are important because that's what I'm lecturing on. You're adding the things that you might pick up from the textbook. And you're forcing yourself to write it on the page again, which is the way you're going to be tested on it by writing it on the page. If you've already done it a couple of times um, before you come in to, to do it, it long term memory is going to kick in for you. Right. Well, and just by the action of writing, what you're trying to retain is another way to retain. You know, it's like I tell people when you're driving in your car. Pretend you're teaching a class on sodium potassium pump, and that will help you know what you know, <laughs> yeah. right? If you're right, you're right. Okay, potassium cells like to go into the, you know. So um, that's the other thing that I have been known to do, um, and I don't. I'd like to know your opinion on this. Um, I used to post how to make chicken soup, and I would oh. ask them to buy a whole chicken from a butcher with mm -hmm. the heart and the brain and everything there other than it's already been plucked. Uh -huh. It's optional because I know people don't like this. Oh, but, that sounds cool to me. Yeah. Wait, I do wait. post how to make chicken <laughs> soup and I have them go to a butcher and buy a whole chicken and dissect the chicken essentially to make the soup. And again, it's optional. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. Keep anyone out, but I have had really good feedback on that for those handful of students that go home and say, I'm going to make chicken soup with a whole chicken. Um, you know, they've learned to take out the gizzards. They learned to take out the liver. Um, it's a mini A and P class for 20 bucks. Right. And you know what, you know, what's in that, that, that I try to build into even the simpler assignments that I have, what's in that is that they're going to have to, at some point, muddle through. Uh -huh. there, there is no great guide on dissecting a whole chicken. Right. Um, and so they're going to have to see some things that they don't recognize, right. um, figure out where the things class. are. Yeah. And then they yeah. come to class saying, I found the pancreas next to the liver, you know, yeah. and it's like, oh, <laughs> let me talk about where the human pancreas is. You know, it's yes. kind of, yeah. and again, I make it optional. So nobody, you know, gets upset or figures out something that's not quite right. But 
it's a great way to touch tissue um, and, and to kind of see what organs look like without getting too deep. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and that's, you know, and, and I'm, I'm about to say some, some things about, about this kind of stuff, but that's one of the, I am, um, you know, I won this award for um, my online anatomy and physiology class, but I am still, I'm, I'm a newbie. I am very young in this and I am still solidly in the, we got to get them in for lab camp. Um, and so, uh, if there are people that are solidly in the other camp, boy, would I like to hear what they what they do? Because there are situations, there are times when I can't, when I'm not allowed to do a lab, and I would like to find the things that work around. But that's why I really like your your activity. Yeah. It's really engaging. The chicken soup works, it, yeah. even if they only mess about with it a little bit. They've still touched tissue and found a liver. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. Sounds fun. Steve, yeah, I, I just wanted to give you your 15 minute time check. Sorry, Tara. Oh, okay. Oh, no problem. I'll, I'm going to mute now. Okay. Thanks, Tara. Um, we, that's, that's good because I, I, I did want to start tying it up here. Um, there are, I consider this class to be absolutely a newer work in progress. And there are things that I need to do to get it to where I want it to be. Um, and my hope, part of my hope from, from presenting this to all of you today is to get more eyes on it and get some suggestions like, Tara, that's, that's awesome. Some, some things about what I can do to uh, going forward. And here's, let me focus your attention on a couple of things that are really important to me right now. Um, how do you assess student engagement? It, it's very clear to me that engagement is important. Um, engagement with me, engagement with each other, engagement with the material so that they modify it in some way to make it their own. Um, but engagement and, and engagement clearly is very important to the powers that be, the accrediting bodies. You hear them talk about engagement all the time. The question is, how do you assess student engagement? So I would be really um, interested in learning that. It's the kind of thing where, where I was in a, a Canvas educator class. Uh, well, I'm actually still in it right, right now. And one of the things when the topic of engagement that comes up with faculty over and over again is, that's kind of like pornography. Um, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, right? Uh, engagement, I know, I know when I see it. How do you assess engagement? I have a survey, if you're interested, that I, that I wrote to attempt to get some information from students on engagement, and it's linked at the end of this presentation too, if you would like, if you're interested in seeing that. The path I took was to have, to find a, a whole bunch of behaviors that I would consider to be indicative of engagement, whether they're in class or out of class, and ask them to rate them on a Likert kind of a scale. Um, and it says, essentially, um, the, the cool thing about that is that, that I can link that to Canvas. I can link that to outcomes. And Canvas will do the accumulating for me. And I, I hope it, that I can use that as a formative way to assess engagement and to inform me on what I need to be working on next. Um, and then this, uh, you know, I've presented to you uh, maybe a third of the changes that I've made in the in in this class. I've, it's been a a a concerted effort for for three years um, modifying the class and I and, and I'm still working on it. Um, but here's the part that I need to think about and that I would love to hear suggestions about too. And that is, does, does it make a difference? Um, how do you um, to do other than anecdotally, how do you measure these things and how do you prove to um, an accrediting body, for instance, that 
the things I've done to increase engagement make a difference? Can I relate engage the, the scores they get on engagement to the scores they get in their class? Um, can, I uh, can I relate it to continuation, um, to completion of the class? Um, those are the things that I don't know. Um, there is a link, a link to this presentation and here's a bunch of other links to things that I was unfortunately able to say just very little on and then and then roll on through my contact information please contact me if you if you've got any ideas for me or if I can help you with some things would love to um, get a hold of me sometime um, Gwen is a superstar uh, Scott's a superstar thank you to both of those people for uh, helping me out and getting me through uh, all of these things, um, I, and I'm and, and this is just my bio that's that I suck at the end. Um, I I'm open to questions if there uh, if if there are any. Um, thanks, thank thank you all for for showing up. It, it really does a heart good. Uh, are there any questions? Tara has a question in the chat. Tara, do you want to just go ahead and take the mic and ask your question? Uh, do you have any favorite um, videos that just are the students really identify with that you tend to show every quarter? Um, tutorials that I have get used a, a lot. The, the cool thing about Canvas is that they can it'll, it'll tell you how often they get used and they get used a lot and um if you if you want those i would be happy to send them to you and you can you can use what you want to want to use thank you send I, me. I, videos always i always try and show like a 10 minute video and then i lecture because i feel like they they like the videos and then maybe i can explain where the I, gaps are in the video maybe i do have a bunch of there one of the links so you want to check this out one of the links in that in my uh in my shell is to animations and videos Okay. And there are some really cool, you know, some animation things like synaptic transmission, you know, some really yeah. difficult things to, to, to see that are there that are cool that I've found. And um, I, I think you'll, you'll enjoy them. And, and if, you, if there's anything you can't find or can't access, I would be, I'm more than happy to share it all. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing anything else in the chat, but if you have a question, please feel free to take the mic and ask away. We do have a few minutes left, so um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe have you share some things you're doing in your course too. I see Gwen waving at us. <laughs> I think she's talking to the class. Yeah, she might be. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's not going through. Can you not hear? Yep, can we hear got you now. You. Yeah, we can hey, hear you okay. now. So I just wanted to say these colleagues having having another You're fading in and out, Gwen. <laughs> yeah, your audio is kind of spotty, Gwen. But I did hear some clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Steve, you do have a question from Barchin. Barchin is asking, is there a specific format or code to make Canvas pages phone friendly? Oh, Barchin, that's that uh, that's something I'm I am currently in the process of looking at. The quick answer is I don't think so. Um, it is, you know, there's there's a lot of things that Canvas does really well. Um, and a lot of things that you have to kind of jerry rig it to do. Um, and that's, I'm in the jerry rig stage right now that um, there's a lot you can do with just basic formatting. Like you notice that that first page that I had was, was formatted cell phone shaped. So that seems to make a big difference. Um, and uh, if, if you're interested in trying trying to do that, I'd be happy to to work with you with that too. So let's see if we can 
make the whole thing cell, cell phone formatted, formatted. I wish Canvas would make that adjustment automatically, but it, a lot of the adjustments it makes on, onto cell phones are terrible adjustments. Like you, you lose a whole side of the page or you lose, you know, they're, they're bad. And so that, that first page um, that I have is a, is a tweak. Yeah. Yeah. There, um, there oh, are the, some mobile guides. Oh, the, sorry, Steve. Oh, I, I see some in the, in the te text. So can you show the redirect link? Um, it is, let's see. Wow. Hey, how's it going? Okay. Are you, are you seeing my screen again? Yes. There it is. Okay, so the way that that I that I get to it um, is through settings. Um, and apps, snap. Um, and it's one of the ones and I, I don't know if this is automatic with canvas um, or or not, it is, re, uh, and you just type in redirect, and there it is, that's the one right there, the redirect tool with that that curvy thing right there. The cool thing about that, about this link, is that you can put whatever you like in the, the menu over here um, by entering the right, the right page there. And so you can, you can modify Canvas's basic setup to work with your, with your setup by doing that. And so there's my Zoom 101 that's that's actually in that in that link. That's not one that anybody else has unless they've physically gone in and, and stuck it in there. So when they click on that, then they, they go to your Zoom page and you get a Zoom notification they want to talk to you? Yeah, they go directly to my my Zoom. They actually go directly into as into the conversation. And I've got it set on a waiting room. So they end up in a waiting room and it says it will it will tell them wait for like five minutes. If I can if I can turn off whatever I'm doing and get to you in five minutes, then I will. If I can't, then Canvas sends you a automatically sends you a notification and email that someone has contacted you and, and when and who it was. And so you can get back to them real easy. Thank you for showing that. One quick question. Do you advertise? Do you post somewhere the hours that you might be available where they could click on that and talk to you? Yes, absolutely. So, so that's right. That's uh, instructor's availability right there on the first on the first page. Um, and so my schedule is just right there. So they can access it anytime. Try to be really clear that, you know, there's this off duty line here, you know, if you if you contact me at eight at, at 8 p.m. in the evening, I'm not going to talk to you until the next day. But uh, um, they should they should have a pretty good idea most of the time where I where I am. Thank you very much. I appreciate all you've shown us. Yes, thank you, thank you thank so you. much, Steve. Uh, Tara has one last quick questions uh, question uh, wanting to know, do you have many students that randomly want to Zoom with you? And then when you're finished with that, I'll close us out. Um, let's say not a lot, but more than come by my office for office hours. Strangely enough. That's a great way to answer that question. <laughs> um, it, yeah, strangely enough. I mean, it's, it's pretty intimidating to come by somebody and I, I'm always asking them to come in, but it's pretty intimidating to do that. You have to admit that you, you know, have a problem of some sort. Um, but yeah, it's it's it works better than people stopping by, and in fact, even when it's my in class class, I'm more likely to get a Zoom call from somebody than a stop in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and um, screen share real quick just to close us out here. And thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Um, just a few notes before we go. Just wanted to give you all a reminder of where to find the recording. I did put that link into the chat for you. 
Um, so please feel free to look for the uh, recording with corrected captions in a couple of weeks. And we'll also post Steve's other resources and slides there as well. And then again, thank you for being here. Uh, it was great to see you all today. I hope you all had a great teaching year, get to take a little bit of time off during the summer. Um, please plan to join us again next spring for more fabulous presentations. And if you are interested in presenting about something awesome you're doing in your class that you'd like to share, uh, please go ahead and contact me at acells at sbctc.edu and we'll get you set up to um, share with everyone. And if you are interested in uh, winning the Connie Broughton Innovation in eLearning Award, we will be sending out a call for applications in the fall. And um, Steve was lucky enough to be nominated by colleagues at his campus. So you can either apply for yourself, nominate someone else, or you could possibly be nominated by someone. So um, please um, keep watching the Wacky Wednesday webinars. We're um, happy to have you here with us. And thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing and turn off our um, recording. Uh, please feel free to unmute, say thank you, give Steve a round of applause, congratulate him for his well-deserved award. Yay. Thank you, Steve. Congratulations. Thank you.